So if a central plot line is the fight for freedom, the desire to, to remain or to, to discover even the, the greater power of being a subject and being an individual. And you said earlier that you have also an observation of, of a social network and, and its impact. Place these two characters for me in the story because we are individuals, each one of us, we can have our own, not just page on Facebook, we can have our own YouTube channel and so on. And yet there is a conundrum of how that plays on the social media and how much we are shaping the social media and how much it shapes back our consciousness. Mm -hmm. Give me some, give me the, the commentary, the story that as you see it. So of course there is a, again, relations between, from us to our social media and back. But I think that in the, in the, when you check it in the end, it's the social media gave us the, our voice to share our thoughts, to share uh, all, the old big revolutions of Me Too and the conversations around climate change and only the way to talk with one, one another and to compare uh, the price that we pay, it's all an outcome of uh, social media. And I think that uh, in today's atmosphere, we must remember it when we criticize and we, there is what to criticize. In, to, to, in the social media. I mean, we must remember that there, they are, as I see it, a lot of powers who would do a lot of things in order to delete all this big revolution of the social media. I mean, it's cha it changed, as we spoke, we changed our life in such a fundamental way because we, because we start to share our thoughts one with another and uh, when I talk about freedom, I talk about the powers who try to stop this change, talking about uh, delete Facebook, talking about the idea that the, the, those ideas are not different from uh, what China did with Jack Ma. It's the same idea that try to make the make those uh, corp corporates uh, weaker. And I think that, uh, I, I would say it like this, I prefer a strong corporate. I know it's a provoking saying, I prefer a strong corporate than a strong state. I mean, a corporate, I can leave. State, when it become total, it, I, I won't have anything to do. So you are revealing your point of view in there about the what you describe as, as totalitarian China. But when you look at the power and the rise of China um, and its collision with, with the West, how do you tell that story? Because um, you, you you're not a futurist, but you are always inquiring into how the plot line will evolve. So I think that the fundamental dis dis distinction between China and the liberal order were always the question of freedom, right? I mean, we, in the liberal order, we thought that in order to create a economic growth, we must give freedom to people. This was a basic idea. And then China came and not really, but in a way proved that you can create an economic growth without giving freedom. And this idea of taking the freedom out of people and not paying the price of the lack of freedom become, I think, very attractive to a lot of old, older people who anyway understands or feel that they have become less and less relevant and therefore much, uh, much weaker. So in this combination between the two, you can see how these Chinese ideas of totalitarianism become something that it's no longer a big no-no to say in, a liberal, in the liberal conversation. And this is what I think it's very, I find it uh, very scary. I mean, in a lot of ways, 
I don't think that there is a big fight between America and China. There's both in the same side against the revolutions that we talk about it here. Given the way you describe the... I'm the sorry that I'm terrifying your listeners. I mean... But, uh, it's good. It's all part of uh, opening our eyes to uh, seeing the world through different eyes and, and through different stories. Just staying for a minute with your comment about social media, I'm, I'm curious, how do you manage the psychology of a, of a columnist? Um, do you read all the, all the comments under your column? Do you, do you process uh, those or, or do you uh, choose to ignore them? Because uh, one, the, one of the challenges, one of the interesting comments about that, uh, that we need to reflect, given the personal exposure to so many people, like you have many, many thousands of people reading your columns. So your nervous system, if the evolutionary biology of, of your nervous system, even if, if you were part of a large tribe, you needed to historically deal with the tribe, but now you need to deal with, with many thousands, maybe sometimes tens and hundreds of thousands of people expressing a point of view about what you said. How do you manage the, the power of it? Um, it can be addictive. Um, for you to be creative, you, you need to find a strategy how to, to process through that. Yeah. What's, what's your way? So I, I first say that I really believe that my column, it's a, a tool of conversation. I mean, from the beginning, I uh, gave my email address, address in the end of the column. And I really, I love when people write to me, they write a lot. And I don't read the comments in the newspaper, I mean, in the website. But I do share my column in the in Facebook, and there, I I not only read the comments, I try to react and uh, create a conversation because I believe I'm no longer you know I give lectures, and when people invite me to lecture, I say I no longer know how to give a lecture. I can create a conversation. Let's talk, and I really believe that in what we said about moving from craft to mass production to craft again. It's this, in the same idea. I don't. I no longer know how to give a. I don't know how to define it. A, a lecture that it's only I give. I only give information to the crowd. No, I know how to talk. I know how to understand and how to listen. And in the column, it's the same. I mean, it's not only me telling you what to think. We are trying to think together about the world, about the situation, whether you like it or not, whether you believe me, whether you not. But. I mean, it's a tool for conversation to me. Yeah, that's very powerful for me. The, the line about uh, create new futures um, in, in the book I wrote is, is how we change the world uh, through conversation. And um, what you are framing here is the idea that in the ideological age, okay, um, answers contain the power. And often the, those were fanatic answers. We now know that all these answers were too simplistic, but they worked for, for that time or for a period of time. And so much of what you are describing reflects that the power moved from having answers to creating questions and creating new questions as conversation tools, as story making tools. I'm running a very lucrative consulting practice, as, as you know, not on the premise of the answers that I have because I don't, but on the premise of the questions that I ask and on how I ask these questions and on the ecology of inquiry that I enable for these teams. If you told me 25 years ago that these large corporations will write me these big checks for the questions I ask them, I would, I would say you're a liar. I, I wouldn't believe that, but it, it's a proof point that just through the experience of one person, I'm obviously not, not the only person, there are many people who are able to catch the, that transformative arc of the last two, three, four decades, that so much of the self-invention and the discovery of, of new, as you, as you just said, it's not about you giving a lecture, it's about you framing a, con a new conversation with your audience oh. and inviting them to become characters in the stories you tell together with them, it, you co-create with them a new story. It actually, it, it connected to what we said about the distinction between technological enterprise and conceptual enterprise. 
in technological enterprise create products, create answers, but conceptual uh, enterprise create big new questions. This is a way to create a new world. Literature, it's only about questions. It's not about answers. Culture in general, it's about questions. You create worlds by using questions, not by using uh, answers. And so I totally agree, of course. What for you is the place of, I'm going to use this word and, and I'm going to frame it inside everything we're describing and inside your, your map of meaning. What for you is the place of the spiritual realm or the spirit? And I don't mean it necessarily in the religious sense, but in the sense of the search to discover what's beyond the here and now. Perhaps the search to discover consciousness, whatever way you define the spirit and the spiritual. I had another portals conversation with somebody a few weeks ago and he said he defines spirit as the in-betweenness. Like when two people are in a dialogue, like the two of yes. us now, the space in between us, the, the power of the conversation and the search to map meaning he said, is for him where spirit uh, reveals itself. But in the bigger picture of your inquiry and how you map meaning and philosophy, map for me the place of spirit and the spiritual and perhaps even the, the religious inside that. I think that there is much more than what we see and sense in the world that we must recognize that we are only a small part. And I think this is where spirit takes place in my experience. I mean, you asked me before about how I, uh, how I would uh, define people who are much more creative, etc. And I told you that the understanding that they live inside the story. When you understand that you live inside the story, you understand that there, there is a lot of other stories around you. And you're always in conversation with them. You're always in relations with them. And this moment when you when your story meets other story, this is for me experience of a, a spiritual experience. I mean, you talked about questions. Questions by definition, it's a spiritual a spirituality experience because you ask something in the world and then you get the feedback. The time when you ask something in the world and you got the feedback, this is a, a, spiritu a spiritual experience. This is why culture is about questions. I would call it a, a note, a partitura, how do you say it, a, a score. It's not a, music, it's not a musical, it's not a musical score, or it is a yes. musical? Yeah, it, it is. Okay, so when you write a novel, you write a, a musical score. The reader plays it to his ears and every reader plays it different. And the moment between what you wrote or the questions that you ask or I ask and the answers that we get, this is a worse uh, spirituality take place in the world. That's beautiful. So it's the interpretation of the story. This is so curious. Um, th there is uh, this idea that Someone said once that if earlier centuries were centuries of letters, that the, the late 20th century uh, and early 21st century, because of the prominence of uh, the computing revolution, will perhaps be a century of numbers. Given everything you are describing, I'm prone to say no. Actually, it's more a century of images and visions and and how do we create images create stories that connect with people's minds and hearts that is what i hear in, in when you describe when your story connects with another story there is actually a spiritual experience i mean this is the People who talk about the times of numbers, I think they're, not, they're really not understanding the spirit of our time. I mean, numbers become less and less important. I mean, technology can do the numbers for us, but what technology can't replace, it's our, our ability to create stories. I mean, this is 
if, if, I, if you would ask me to define the essence of a human being, it's the, the power to create stories. And when we, understand, when we understand it, we can understand all the trends that are happening now uh, that really accurate what it means to be a human being. A curious question, a surprise curious question. If you need to choose one biblical figure that you most identify with, who would you choose? I, I, I have a guess, but I, I want to say what, what would you say? Okay. Uh, I love the prophets. I mean, they're all by their opposition to the world. I really identified with this uh, idea, uh, moral, moral idea and existential idea of being opposition to the world. I mean, this is something that uh, I admire and I try to be like this, standing. There is a sentence of uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, the French philosopher who said, the author is the, is the ultimate uh, traitor because it's all the time inside and outside. And I think this position of being inside the story, being committed to the story, but still have the ability to look at it from outside, this, this was the power of the prophets and I really I admire them also. Yes. What, what was your guess? I thought you will say, it's similar to the prophets, but I thought you, you might say Yosef um, for uh, interpreting the dreams of... of uh, oh. Yeah. Um, closing question, uh, Yaya. This has been a, a fascinating exploration. Uh, what do you hope to be writing about in five years and in 10 years' time? I really hope that I will be able to write, I'm working on a, a big book that will describe what we're talking about now. I mean, I'm not trying to predict, predict what's going to happen. I, I think that we can't, but I really think that we must define the moment that we're standing, standing here now. I mean, because, because what we talked about, we're still think through the old context and we are not understanding the new context that we are facing with. And I think this is what I'm trying to write about and trying to define, give people the tool to understand that we are not, that we are not able to understand, okay? That we, are, we don't know, that we must ask questions, that we must create a new platforms or a new infrastructures in order to create the new story. Because if we're trying now to find the magical solutions we will by definition will fail. But if we understand that we are not able to find the solutions now, we are only able to start thinking, marking what doesn't work, uh, start listening to people, start to try to understand the deeper uh, sense of our uh, soul, I will say, um, only if we do this, I think we'll be able to create a new relevant story. And we must remember that there are a lot of powers in the world who do understand that the new story has been written now. And if we won't do it, other powers with other interests will do it and uh, it will be a big loss for us. The, the, I imagine the great challenge in trying to put in a, in a unified book, a, a theory of everything, kind of a book about this current time, um, is that you're trying to define something that almost escapes definition because the very nature of what you're describing in this idea of shape-shifting consciousness and evolving from one story to the next by itself, as, as the descriptor, as the character of the time, by itself resists definition. That's the beauty, I imagine, of, of having a column to write because you, you, you get to write every other week a, a new chapter of a story, but putting it together in a, in a book, that too, the construct of a book may evolve. It, it, you may have a digital copy of the book that you continue to, right. to evolve over time. Of course, but, but in, in what you said before, I think that I, I love the example of Immanuel Kant, actually, we mentioned him before that he, he creates a new modern philosophy, 
but how he created it, not by, by saying something new about the world. He said, I can't tell you anything about the world. I only know how to criticize. And he wrote the criticize three books of criticism about the world, about what's happening. And I think that in time of in times of how, in time of fundamental changes, we must remember that our uh, survival and growth tool, it's not offering a new solutions now, magical solutions at that time, no. Stop and criticize the world. What I see, do I see the right things? Do I feel the world? Do I really feel the world? How do I uh, translate it into a, a new forms of thinking? How I create a new language, etc. And I think that, you know, uh, big revolutions create not from the solutions, but from the questions, but from the criticism. I really believe in it. Here is my question. Is this an, a revolutionary age or is this a transformation age? Because maybe they're not the same. I think that in a lot of ways, no, this is uh, the sense of humor of God. It goes together in a lot of ways. I mean, every big transform has its uh, revolutionary uh, characters. But I think that it's our ch our uh, uh, our choice to decide if we want to be more in the revolutionary side or in the transformational side. And I think as we we begin our talk with the flood, this is our choice to, in a lot of ways, bring the floods, bring the flood, and then move the live in the transform time or uh, not seeing what is going on, and, uh, and then the flood will come and we won't be prepared. And the implicit it's message... It's much more violent and revolutionary, etc. And the implicit message is, we are called in this time to um, build our own Noah Ark, just the Ark now, and, and collect what we will collect into it. But the place perhaps we begin to do so is, is with our minds, with the stories we tell, and with the people we connect with. I agree, and I think we must remember that the Noah Ark, it's not a content, it's only an infrastructure. Mm. It's only a frame that we, Noah was not able to imagine what will happen in the world after the flood. So we create an ark. And then what is going on then, the new story, Create by the process that's happening in the ark and afterwards. So we must remember that we are not look, looking now for a, a content or a product, okay? We are looking for a platforms. We are looking for, for a infrastructures that if we'll be free enough and if we'll give a, the creative minds the tools to create new things and if we will listen to the world, we will find the new story. Thank you. Thank you on this beautiful note. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Aviv.